Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Tom Wolfe grew up in Richmond, Virginia, received his undergraduate degree from Washington and Lee in 1951, tried out, alas, unsuccessfully for the pitching staff of the then New York Giants, then received a doctorate in American Studies from Yale University in 1957. His impact on American journalism and letters since leaving Yale has proven so immense that his current editor at Little Brown said that publishing Tom Wolfe is, quote, like publishing Mark Twain. He is the author of, among many other works, The Candy-Colored Tangerine Flake Streamline Baby. It is impossible to read that title without, a, without smiling. The Right Stuff, The Bonfire of the Vanities, and I Am Charlotte Simmons. Tom Wolfe is currently completing a novel to be published in 2009 entitled Back to Blood. Back to Blood, you once proclaimed that the new journalism, the application of literary <laughs> techniques to nonfiction would, I quote you, wipe out the novel as literature's main event. Tom Wolfe, why are you working on your fourth novel? Well, what you just said is absolutely true. As we speak, right here, as we speak, the novel is dying a horrible death. Um, it really is. It's is just, it? it's, uh, it's had it. And soon it'll be in the same position as epic poetry was in, in the early 19th century. You know, that had always been the great genre. Um, and, but nonfiction will continue. And the memoir and autobiography will never die, never has died. And they're interesting, these memoirs and autobiographies, because they're, uh, they're like Wikipedia. Some of it may be true. Uh, and, uh, if only inadvertently. Yeah. But why then have you, let's see, the uh, Bonfire of the Vanities, published in 1979, if I recall. No, that was, uh, the right stuff was published then. Pu uh, it I'm was sorry. published in 1987. 87. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A Man in Full is Atlanta in the New South in the 1990s. But, of course, Bonfire of the Vanities is New York in the 80s. A Man in Full, Atlanta, the rise of the South mm -hmm. in the 90s. I am Charlotte Simmons, student life in America in the 21st century. Back to Blood is what? Oh, it's a, it's a novel, um, and it's, it's set in Miami. My real interest is immigration. Immigration, yeah. all right. And, oh, a couple of years ago when I first got the idea and I would tell people what I was doing, they'd say, oh, that's so interesting. And their heads would fall over. They, they'd go to sleep like a horse, you know, standing up. Uh, since then, the subject has picked up a little momentum. Um, and I'm just curious, my real curiosity is how immigrants actually feel, uh, what their own social structure uh, is like, for such a thing does exist. Um, and in general, I, to me, the immigrants have been a mystery, and I assume to a lot of, a lot of people, the, and to one another. Little Brown's press release announcing that they had acquired the book is about two months ago, as I recall. Yeah, I, yes, I think it was early, early January. All right, early January. But I suspect, given the way you approach a novel, that you'd been at work at it for some time. Not, not really all that uh, long. I, oh, really? I'm at the stage now, I make rash predictions that this will be out next, uh, <clears throat> next fall. Right. Not mean the fall of 2009. All right. Um, go ahead. Immigration. Two quotations. Quotation one, Harvard political scientist Samuel T Huntington. Unlike past immigrant groups, Mexicans and other Latinos have not assimilated into mainstream U.S. culture, forming instead their own political and linguistic enclaves from Los Angeles to Miami. The persistent inflow of Hispanic immigrants threatens to divide the United States into two peoples, two cultures, and two languages. Quotation number two former governor of Florida, Jeb Bush, quote, Samuel Huntington needs to get a life, <laughs> close quote. Whose side are you on on that one? Well, <clears throat> this is not a policy book, you understand. I, I understand <laughs> that. I understand that. Um, I, just on what little I know um, from working on this book, and I stress little, but uh, I, I think bilingualism is going to solve itself. Now, a lot of Latins who don't want to believe that, who don't believe that, I mean, they want to hang on to uh, the Spanish language um, with, great, with great pride. But it's a very, I think it's going to be pretty soon that the succeeding generations of Latin immigrants are really going to go more and more weary of 
of preserving the, the old language because obviously the, um, the for one thing, the, all the movies are uh, in English. That does it. The, uh, uh, the television that they might want to watch is usually in, uh, in English. This, they go to schools, like public schools, everyone's talking. Um, I, I think it's no problem at all. So you have plunged yourself into this red-hot issue of immigration. You've done research, I'm supposing, in Miami. That's the way you go mm -hmm. about your work. And the Samuel Huntingtons of this world, mm -hmm. you say, oh, tut, tut, calm down. It'll all take care of itself. That's roughly your position? You, well, come, certainly... you come away from your own work yeah. unworried. Yeah. Well, from what I've seen, I'm more interested in what's going on that I'm that I am worried. There's nothing I haven't seen anything yet that, that worries me. And Miami, you have to understand, um, is an example of why America is a wonderful country. Um, here is a people from a foreign country with a foreign language, a foreign culture, uh, and within slightly more than one generation, if you figure a generation to be thirty years. Right. Um, <clears throat> They have taken over a huge metropolitan area um, politically. Um, the, I'm talking about the Cubans. Right. And the, <clears throat> the mayor is, is a Cuban, the, even the, uh, all through the police force, every, 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 part, of, every, every part of government. Uh, this is something unique in history because Miami is already the only city, of it, uh, the only city in the world that I know of, that has more um, immigrants, recent immigrants, uh, than it has that more than fifty percent recent immigrants. Right. We, re by recent, I mean in the last fifty years. Right. Uh, and not only that, uh, they, one group, the Cubans, runs the place, uh, and others are moving up fairly swiftly um, beside them. This. Only in America would it, would it could it happen because here, if you've got the votes, if you have a modicum of organization, you win at the ballot box. Right. It's uh, Ronald Reagan's most sustained applause line that I can recall was in his speech in Miami. Fidel Castro said he would create the greatest Hispanic city in the world, and he did. Only it was Miami, not Havana. <laughs> <laughs> How does Tom Wolfe do what Tom Wolfe does? A moment ago, I quoted you, uh, or you referred to the notion that um, when you got the idea for doing a book on immigration and people would fall asleep until immigration became a hot topic, how did you get the idea? Where do these things come from? Honestly, in that case, I really don't remember, but I, I always prefer subjects that I'm hearing about only in conversation, that haven't been in print yet. And you're hearing about them in conversation because the conversation beats the journalists or because conversation can take up topics that remain politically incorrect? No, I don't think it has to, at the outset anyway, it's not, it has nothing to do with political correctness. Uh, I have a feeling it was just seeing uh, immigrant, mostly Mexican, uh, workers on Long Island at 6 o'clock in the morning standing on the corner waiting to be uh, for a, a day's for work, day li literally a day's right. Uh, a day's work. I, right. That, as I recall, was the first that I was aware of all this. Let me just quote to you <clears throat> from your famous 1989 Harper's essay, Stalking the Billion-Footed Beast. There's a question at the end of this. Publishers had their noses pressed against their thermopane glass walls, scanning the billion-footed city for the approach of the young novelists who, surely, would bring them the big novels of the racial clashes, the hippie movement, the new left, and the Wall Street boom, the sexual revolution, the war in Vietnam. But such creatures, it seemed, no longer existed. The strange fact of the matter was that young people with serious literary ambitions were no longer interested in big, rich slices of contemporary life." Close quote. Now, that's your manifesto for writing the kind of novels that you write. When did it happen that in this country that who, the, the formative novelist, the great novelist, is Mark Twain, when did it happen that American letters became possessed of precious little stories instead of big, boisterous stories that fit the temper of the country itself. It happened soon after world, the Second World War, and there was a, a key essay by Lionel Trilling, who was a, a 
at, at Columbia. He was a professor, but he also had a huge following among uh, what let us call, uh, I'll explain it later if you want, the, the charming aristocracy. The charming aristocracy, <laughs> all right. Um, and he said the day of the um, realistic novel is over. It's been done, it's been done to death. Uh, there's, and besides, we live in a fractured society now, and you cannot do a slice of life uh, and pretend that this slice of life has given you all the life in the country. Uh, the future of the novel is in the novel of ideas. Well, it so happened he had one in his desk, <laughs> which uh, he duly produced. Which uh, novel was that? I, I mean, nobody remembers it. Uh, I certainly <laughs> don't. <laughs> All right. And uh, it was duly published and duly praised by the charming aristocracy. Um, and then it sank like a stone in a pond. Um, but the idea was out there that, that the realistic novel has been done. Um, and the novel of ideas was next. Well, that's why immediately somebody like, uh, well, Norman Mailer, who had made a, a big name for himself with a war novel, realistic war novel. The Naked, the Naked and the, and the Dead. Dead, sure. Follows that up with a, a, uh, a novel called Barbary Coast, which is unfortunately not about the Barbary Coast. It's about a group of people in a boarding house in Brooklyn. Uh, and they're having long conversations about life and politics and a lot of ideas. It's exactly right. what Lionel Trilling was calling for. And it, well, Mailer has many unreadable novels, but uh, that was among the most un, uh, unreadable. I'm happy to see that the mere accident of his death has not changed the way you speak <laughs> about him. Well, I, I, I know that Norman would want me to speak truthfully about him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Actually, that leads to another question now. In, um, so, your novels speak for themselves because they've sold hundreds of thousands of copies. It is manifest that American readers want what you're producing. On the other hand, uh, in reviewing A Man in Full, John Updike, Norman Mailer of Blessed Memory, John Irving, all accuse you of being a journalist, that this is not literature, it's not really fiction. And you reply, how? I asked the question knowing that you did reply in an essay <laughs> called My Three Stooges, but, but, the, but the point here is, well, Wolf is on to something, but really when it comes down to it, if you read that stuff, it's journalism. This was, to me, a sign of um, the charming aristocracy at work. Let me... You'd better explain better the term. Explain yes, that. yes, yes. In, <clears throat> You're teasing me with it. I'll give. Go ahead. Explain. <laughs> uh, we're still little colonials of the French when it comes to theory. Uh, in the 1880s, um, a man named Catal Mendes, who was a minor, turned out to be a minor poet in France. We now know him to have been minor. <laughs> okay. um, said that real writers no longer expect to be read by multitudes of people. And Zo people like Zola and Flaubert and, and uh, Maupassant, uh, are the past. The, uh, those three happened, well, not Flaubert so much, but Zola and Maupassant, probably the two most popular writers in the world mm -hmm. in the 1880s. Uh, naturalism, which was their genre, uh, is, is finished. Um, now people want to write for a charming aristocracy. Uh, and he was speaking of writers like uh, Baudelaire, uh, Mallarmé, and, and uh, Rambeau. Um, and he said, you know, in effect, he said, they don't, they're not going to put their hands down in the muck of so-called naturalism. Uh, they send off wafts of sensibility. Oh. Um, and, of course, the charming aristocracy is an aristocracy of taste. And in order to prove that you are an aristocrat of taste, you have to like things that the great mass of humanity can't understand. Um, and... Hence, um, something like journalism, which is written precisely so that the great masses of humanity can, can right. understand it, um, is, would, would be looked down upon by the charming uh, aristocracy. In fact, in American literature, uh, um, essentially a journalistic approach has been behind Twain, every, for goodness sake. Hemingway, success. right. Hemingway <clears throat> uh, went about writing novels that way, but even more to the point, uh, Sinclair Lewis, our first uh, 
um, Nobel Prize winner in literature, uh, to do a novel about his hometown, Sauk Center, Minnesota. Uh, he didn't just draw on his memories, he went back right. with uh, five by eight cards, those things you end up with in graduate school, um, taking notes on every area of life. John Steinbeck, in the right. case of The Grapes of Wrath, which is really the book that won him the Nobel Prize, um, went to the San Francisco News, that, w that was such a paper at the time, um, and volunteered to go out and write a series on these migrant workers who were pouring in from the Dust Bowl into, mm. into uh, California in the <clears throat> mid to late 30s. Um, he didn't know anything about them except for the fact that they were living in, under apparently deplorable uh, 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 circumstances. He went out as a reporter, really, and he was actually with a newspaper uh, to give himself credentials. Uh, and just immersed himself in the, in the lives of these of these. So people. you refute John Updike by saying Twain, Hemingway, Sinclair Lewis, <laughs> Steinbeck, they're good enough for me. Well, <clears throat> they're probably good enough for for anybody, even 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 even, even Updike. Even they. As you complete Back to Blood, you are working on, or perhaps mm -hmm. it's the next item on your desk. Let's put it this way. You've talked about it in the press, a book mm -hmm. called The Human Beast. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time you appeared on this program, a decade ago, I'm very sorry to say, you had just written an essay in Forbes magazine called Sorry But Your Soul Just Died. Yes. That was, go ahead. That, that was a big, that was a very big essay. It got noticed absolutely everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it, that, you have continued your interest in neuroscience. It was about neuroscience, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now. Um, you've written about figures in science who have had profound effects on popular culture, notwithstanding that the scientists have moved on. Could you please comment on the following list? Darwin, Marx, Freud, E.O. Wilson. The common thread there is the power of the word um, and the Darwin was a, relative, was a really an obscure man. He had a famous grandfather, um, in, famous in an academic sense. Uh, and he came up with uh, a theory that by itself, <clears throat> uh, and incidentally stole it from a poor young man named Wallace, but um, it, it, was, it was the most outrageous uh, act of plagiarism in, in the history of academic uh, pursuits. Uh, anyway, that's, that's all right. Marx, the same way. Here's an unpleasant man, uh, a loner, and he's working away in the uh, British Museum writing Das Kapital. But the idea um, is something that changes human history in the large and obvious ways. Also, Darwin, uh, <clears throat> uh, Freud, uh, exactly the same. Uh, Freud introduced the idea th that uh, the human being is like a s steam boiler. Um, and the steam is sex sexual drive. And that if you don't equip the steam boiler with uh, a means of releasing the pressure. Safety valve. A safety valve. It'll, the thing will, the, it'll blow up. Um, and just as the as, as humans uh, would, and so he put forth the idea: that you really have to have sex steadily and frequently. Although he himself was a bit of a, a prude about that thing, um, and that idea has never died. In fact, at this moment, another thing that's going on, as is, the novel is dying, as the novel is dying, um, <laughs> maybe it needs a little s sexual impetus. I don't know. The <clears throat> There's probably, let's take a guess, seven to eight million orgasms at this moment that would not have occurred had Sigmund Freud never, uh, never lived. You're making me smile, and I don't want my children to see me smiling at that, Tom. And, and Edward O. Wilson is the most interesting uh, character. He's a, a zoologist, his specialty is, is ants, and he's really done some marvelous things on the subject of ants. Um, He's won two Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, he puts forth now the genetic theory that practically every side of life and, uh, and everyone's life is 
genetically predetermined. And in fact, he has said, summed up the whole thing in a sentence. He said, every human brain is born not as a blank slate waiting to be filled in by experience, but as a uh, film, a piece of film as from a camera, waiting to be slipped into developer fluid. And he's, by which he means you can develop it well, you can develop it poorly, but all you're going to get is what was on that piece of film um, at birth. Uh, the, the overarching theory is that we are, after all, machines. Mm. Um, and we are programmed in, in, by genes. Um, and there's no way we can change decisions because we have no free will. We're just, we we're, have no free will. Now, when you appeared on this program mm. last time, two quotations, both Tom mm. Wolfe, I asked you, are you persuaded by this science that we're all, in effect, mm -hmm. machines, no free will, no moral capacity? And Tom Wolfe replied, quote, I'm afraid that the science is true, close quote. Tom Wolfe, in an interview earlier this year, quote, the genetic theorists know in their hearts that their reasoning is bogus. Would you please explain the development in your thinking, Mr. I Wolf? made a, I made a, when I wrote, sorry, but your but soul, your soul just, just died. died right? um, I made the mistake of uh, which I now freely admit of conflating, I think that's the word, neuroscience and genetic theory. Mm. Um, they have, it turns out, almost nothing to do with one another. Uh, neuroscience is a science of how the, the brain actually operates. Um, the, one of the leading figures in that science uh, today is a sp Spaniard named Jose Delgado. His father was perhaps the greatest brain physiologist of the, of the 20th century. And he says, uh, all the rest is literature. But it turns out this is what genetic theory is. The leading proponents, uh, E.O. Wilson, I mean, God bless him, he's a, he was a, a wonderful zoologist. Um, Pretty good writer, too. He's a good writer, excellent yes. writer. He knows, I doubt that he knows as much about the brain as the second year uh, neuro. Uh, a student in neuropsychology, a graduate student in neuropsychology. Daniel Dennett, as a philosopher at Tufts, knows, doesn't even pretend to know anything about the human brain. Uh, Richard Dawkins, the other great uh, name uh, in this area, uh, he doesn't, well, he originally taught ethology, which is the social life of animals uh, uh, at, at, at Oxford. Um, they are writing, they are writing literature. Uh, the thing they do not understand, and this is what will be once I, if I ever get the human beast uh, written, um, they don't understand what speech is. If I may, the, the, the being who speaks, your 2006 Jefferson lecture, quote, evolution came to an end when the human beast developed speech. And you argue that Homo sapiens was at that moment replaced by Homo loquax. Right. Man speaking. Man speaking. Man, <clears throat> man talking. Um, and it's, there are people like Chomsky and others who are wonderful in, in, in speculating or about the, uh, the uh, language as communication, speech as communication, but they don't know the properties of it. Language is, in fact, a, an artifact. Uh, just as much as a, an ancient axe found in, a, in an archaeological By artifact, dig. you mean human construct? Yes. All right. Uh, in any artifact, a, humans, we don't know of any other animals that can do it, humans uh, will take things from nature uh, and use them uh, to create something that never existed before. Um, that was the point which in speech is a matter of taking sounds and using them in code to represent um, uh, ideas, things, doesn't matter. Um, when it's turned into print, or for that matter, a blueprint, it's obviously an artifact. Right. But right. we don't see that, that it's obviously an artifact in, in speech. Now, so your position now, having reflected on this matter for another decade, I intend to check in with you once a decade <laughs> to, to track your thinking as it evolves is that evolution may explain the sheer physical fact of you and me. Mm -hmm. But speech, the human mind, explains status, music, art, commerce, mm -hmm. virtually everything we value. 
That's a fair summary. Oh, exactly. And right. it's using this artifact because um, if you look at the, the beasts of the field, as Darwin referred to them, um, and for that matter, the smallest little fish, uh, status is determined by aggressiveness and power to get the sexual, sexual objects that you want. Right. Um, the female of the species. Right. Um, and whereas today, uh, now that we have language to play with, this artifact to play with, uh, there's innumerable ways of gaining status and, and those uh, love objects that you, uh, that you want. I mean, think of a... Of a even uh, if, he ha if he has a honey tongue, even an ugly man can win the woman. That's, well, it's quite, it's quite true. Or, I mean, I think of Elvis Presley is better known to most Americans uh, than the um, ten presidents preceding Bill Clinton. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. I'm sure. Now, this brings us back, to go back to that discussion we had about a decade ago, to free will, the moral capacity, the religious sense. The last time we spoke on the program, I asked you point blank, does Tom Wolfe believe in God? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. But Tom Wolfe did believe in, I quote, the crucible of self, close quote. And to quote you again, the inviolable self. Is that about where your thinking stands now? Gosh, I was poetic, wasn't I? You're uh, good. <laughs> um, I, well, believing in... Uh, well, um, now, uh, G.K. Chesterton had a marvelous line about believing in yourself. He said, my God, what a slender reed to believe in. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you've got? Uh, and I, and I, I, quite, I quite agree with him. Uh, I don't know what this crucible uh, was, but I do believe that uh, it's, it's something... The, the context choice. was you, you sensed, even this was just after you wrote, mm -hmm. sorry, but your soul just died. And at that point, you had not elaborate, you, you didn't go into this distinction between genetic theory and neuroscience, mm -hmm. but you felt, you said on the program, you just felt that they were wrong. We're not machines. So, each of us is possessed of somehow or other a consciousness, a self. That's what you were talking about at the time. But I think it's a product of, of, of language. Uh, all right, let's, let's say for the sake of argument, we won't argue with the fact, we're, all right, we're machines. Uh, you'll notice that in each era, the scientists who speculate about such things use the prevailing uh, technology as their po point of reference. Mechanical physics had just come to its uh, peak under, when Freud was writing. So, yeah, oh, and, and, and steam. Hence, we're all, ste all steam boilers. They're right. all steam boilers. Today, it's all computers. Yes, and right. So, we're uh, hence, we're all hardwired. Yes, hardwired, right. exactly. Right. And, uh, the all, and there's the, the, the entire vocabulary of, of computers is used. If we are computers, we are chemical analog uh, computers, and I don't know of a single person who can operate a chemical analog. <laughs> uh, tell me what you make of the following statement, quote, what makes man like mm -hmm. God is the fact that unlike the whole world of other living creatures, including those endowed with senses, man is also a rational being, close quote. I'm hoping you'll go for that. To be rational, to think, is to manipulate words. What do you think of that statement? Uh, well, we get back to um, in the beginning. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, so you tend to approve of the statement? The there would be what we call rational thought wouldn't exist uh, without without what, words. I'm, what I've done is edge you onto the same bookshelf as John Paul II, who's the author of that <laughs> statement. I just keep pushing at you. Uh, but I don't think he was going at it uh, quite in terms of the uh, properties of. Uh, of, of speech, uh, there would be no, because rational thought depends upon the ability to ask why. Mm -hmm. uh, without words, there's no way to ask. Have you ever seen an animal shrug? Tom Wolfe and America. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned in a New York Times interview that you admire President Bush, quote, for his great decisiveness and willingness to fight, close quote. Mm -hmm. You later said that the reaction to that Times interview in literary circles was as if you had said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I'm a child molester. <laughs> you sometimes wear an American flag pin in your lapel. You've likened the response to that in the city of New York to holding up a cross to werewolves. That's true. <laughs> My question is, why should this be? You live 80, 90 blocks, as does all of the charming aristocracy, 
from that what is still a hole in the ground, the Twin Towers. This is only six years later, seven years later. Why should it be that they should be so hostile to that you, should, that you of all people? Why? 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 <clears throat> this also goes back to the, the charming aristocracy. For a long, long time now, it's been very unpopular for a, anyone of intellectual pretensions to approve of whatever government right. uh, they have. Uh, it's, it's very much a fashion. Bush has attracted um, unbelievable, uh, I take that back, it's believable, uh, because the same thing happened to Eisenhower, the same thing happened to Reagan. Uh, they were considered stupid. Right. Uh, they, were, they were thought to be just these benighted uh, creatures who obviously were operated by someone else. They always, they were always looking for the, uh, the uh, puppeteer behind Reagan. Right. Um, I mean, they couldn't believe that. And, and all the same with Eisenhower, because Eisenhower could never complete a sentence in a press conference. Right. He would start off with a, uh, a relative clause, like, uh, uh, whereas uh, people in China believe, uh, <clears throat> uh, which reminds me, uh, he could not get to a predicate. Uh, but. He, all he had done, though, he was, he was considered very stupid by the same people. People right. forget this. So was Reagan. Um, and he, well, all that uh, Eisenhower did was win World War II. All that Reagan did was win uh, the Cold War. And so far, we, we don't know how much uh, Bush accomplished, but it's very striking to me that the aggressiveness with which he attacked uh, the training grounds of Al-Qaeda at the very outset uh, did something profound to that movement. I mean, it, mm. it, it, it knocked We've out, not been attacked since. It knocked out some large apparatus right. uh, in, in the meantime. We don't know what the verdict will be on uh, Iraq in the long run because think of Vietnam and the ruckus over Vietnam. Um, and now if you ask uh, people I, uh, who were much against that war at the time, what was uh, what was it that was wrong with that war? They can't remember. can't remember. They can't remember what it was. Uh, was and then, but I asked the question: Do you think the war was a success? Oh no, it couldn't. Have been. I said, Well, look, what was the purpose of it? It was to stop communism in Asia. Uh, did it do it? Well, yes, it did. Yeah. It yeah. did it. Now, last question, but this is going to require a little bit of a setup. Henry Luce famously called the 20th century the American century. Listen to a quotation from another acute observer, Tony Soprano. It's good to be in something from the ground floor. I came too late for that, I know. But lately I'm getting the feeling that I came in at the end. The best is over. Is the best over for America? Or is there some chance that the 21st century will be a second American century? Well, Tony Soprano is also going to a psychiatrist. Nobody does that anymore. <laughs> I mean, talk about, talk about the past. That's the most unreal thing about the... Uh, the uh, Sopranos? About, about the Sopranos. But give me the punchline. I mean, the, the question again... Well, the question is, 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 the 20, is there some prospect that the 21st century can be a second American century, or has this kind of, or are we Britain at the end of the 19th century? Or are we I about think, to lose our dominance? I think we're on the we are on the edge of about 800 more years of American centuries. Frankly, um, we the biggest problem is all the people who see a problem. Um, it's very fashionable to see uh, that to think that the end is near. After the end of the 20th century, which was unquestionably the American century. American ascendancy and everything except thought, which was we were still colonials of, of Europe and to the charming aristocracy. To, to the charming aristocracy, but in every other area uh, we were supreme in a way that no country has ever been before. If you can just review the television specials uh, at the end of the century, and there are many of them that said, uh, "Well, this is a country that has brought great freedom to so many people." But we have people out there like Dr. Death, uh, who wants to uh, who, who wants to have uh, euthanasia uh, be legal. We have the problem of a of militant uh, trainees on the far right in in the, up in the Rockies. Um, everything was hedged uh, by these tremendous uh, uh, these tremendous threats. 
I've covered neo-Nazi, uh, as a newspaper reporter, neo-Nazi demonstrations. You'll find nine poor, benighted people watching around in a circle hoping for television cameras. Uh, in, in, but in, in actual fact, there's absolutely nothing to prevent uh, the next eight centuries, less, next nine centuries. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't, uh, you know, after all, Rome had century after century, and there's no reason why we should have more. If uh, I don't, oh, maybe I should start giving uh, uh, moral advice, which is, be happy <laughs> with what you have. <laughs> Tom Wolfe, thank you very much. For Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson. Thanks for joining us.